Hi, my name is Gregory Wilkins. And today I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit about my new series, Black Lives Matter. In this exhibition, Black Lives Matter, Teach Your Children Well, is a glimpse of where I fit within the BLM movement while living in a racist country. Collectively, we must never forget the struggles of Black and Brown people in the United States and around the globe. We must rise and advance sweeping systematic changes if we are to move forward. I was born in Chicago, Illinois, and I moved from the urban center to a small town in central Florida. I am one of seven children. I have an African-American brother, an Asian brother and sister, and the rest of us are white. Growing up in a multinational and multilingual family, I was different from most of my peers and was faced with adversity. My local community did not understand my global perspective and what it meant to be a gay kid growing up in a transnational family in the 1970s. This empowered me to be an advocate for change. Rather than allowing others to confine me in a cage and silence my queer multicultural voice, my wings were unfurled. I found my authentic self through my art, peculiar and unique. My family has always been cast out as other, a cultural outsider. Living a life of other has shaped my development. While I have Caucasian skin, I have not lived a traditional white experience. As an outsider, I code switch and I move within multiple communities. As a cultural outsider and artist, I share moments of growth and personal discovery through my creative making. Working at the Smithsonian Institution's Museum of American Art during the United States Congress's Cultural War on the National Endowment for the Arts, I was empowered to use my artistic voice to create opportunities for dialogue and to address modern day concerns. I encourage viewers to reflect on social justice, think about their own privilege and how they might affect change. Living in Chicago, diversity surrounded me, church, school, my neighborhood. Moving to Florida when I was nine years old, I quickly learned that my family was unlike most. This was particularly evident when we were invited to our neighbor's house the first few weeks we moved to Florida, and my siblings and I were faced with the N word. Returning soon, after my mother and my father adjourned a family meeting to speak about what we had encountered. And this gave us a framework of what we were going to be confronted the rest of our lives. Racist language and racism were ever present in my adolescence. And I, as a white boy, was forever changed. Now, as an adult, how can I make an, an intentional difference in a racist country? Black lives matter. It is through the process of mattering that I, as an artist and documentarian, push forward. Black Lives Matter is a decentralized political and social movement protesting against incidents of police brutality and all racially motivated violence against Black people. While there are specific organizations like the Black Lives Matter Global Network, the label themselves simply as, quote, 
Black Lives Matter, end quote. The movement comprises a broad array of people and organizations. In July 2013, the movement began with the use of the hashtag Black Lives Matter on social media after the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the shooting death of African American teen Trayvon Martin, who 17 months earlier had died in February 2012. This particularly hit home because Trayvon's murder happened 30 minutes away from where I grew up in Florida. Over four decades have passed since I lived in Florida and racism was alive and well, this time with a global spotlight because of social media. My heart ached for the Trayvon's family, the Black community, and for my own family. Black Lives Matter became nationally recognized for street demonstrations following the 2014 deaths of two African Americans, that of Michael Brown, resulting in protests and unrest in Ferguson, Missouri, a city near St. Louis, and Eric Gardner in New York City. This hit home for me again because in the 1980s, I had gone to high school in St. Louis and experienced the invisible line where white folks lived and everyone else remained. The movement returned to national headlines and gained further international attention during the global George Floyd protests in 2020, following the killing of George Floyd by Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin. I, like so many around the world, was outraged. An estimated 25 million people participated in the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests in the United States, making it one of the largest movement in the country's history. As Americans, we must acknowledge our historical past and work toward a more inclusive and equitable future. The art in this exhibition reflects my evolving series, Black Lives Matter. It highlights memories and reflections of my own growth and development as I continue to find my place in an ever-changing world. The majority of the pieces were created in 2021, except for Black Lives Matter AIDS, a piece I made in 1994 and before the Black Lives Matter hashtag grew in popularity. This collection will continue to grow as I reflect and continue my journey as an artist, activist, and community member. A special thank you to the state of Minnesota for a 2021 Creative Support for Individuals grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board. Thanks to a legislative appropriation by the Minnesota State Legislature and from a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. This piece, Black Lives Matter, Driving While Black, reflects one of the core values of the Fourth Amendment is that the police cannot stop and detain an individual without reason, probable cause, or at least reasonable suspicion to believe that he or she is involved in criminal activity. But recent Supreme Court decisions allow the police to use traffic stops as a pretext to fish for evidence. Both anecdotal and quantitative data show that nationwide, police exercise this discretionary power primarily against Black and Brown people. No person of color is safe from this treatment, regardless of their obedience to the law, their age, the type of car they drive, or the station in life. In short, Skin color has become evidence of the propensity to commit crime, and police use this against minority drivers. Black Lives Matter Screen recognizes the origins of the modern day police mentality 
that can be traced back to the slave patrol. The earliest form of slave patrol was created in the Carolinas in the 1700s with the following mission, to establish a system of terror in response to slave uprisings with the capacity to pursue, apprehend, and return runaway slaves to their owners, including the use of excessive force to control and produce desired slave behavior. Slave patrols allowed forcible entry into any home slowly ba based on the suspicions of protecting runaway slaves. Slave patrols continued until the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment. Following the Civil War during the Reconstruction period, slave patrols were replaced by militia style groups who were empowered to control and deny access to equal rights to freed slaves that looked to join the workforce and integrate with society. Their work included the enforcement of black codes which were strict local and state laws that regulated and restricted access to labor, wages, voting rights, and general freedoms for formerly enslaved people. In 1868, the ratification of the 14th Amendment technically granted equal protections by laws of constitutional rights to African-Americans, essentially meant to abolish these codes known as black codes. Shortly after the abolishment of black codes, Jim Crow laws and state and local statutes that legalized racial segregation were enacted. Jim Crow laws looked to vanquish all protected rights of African Americans. By the 1900s, local municipalities began to construct police departments to enforce local laws in the areas of the East Coast and Midwest including the Jim Crow laws. Local municipalities learned, leaned on police to enforce and exert excessive brutality on African-Americans who violated any Jim Crow law. These laws continued through the end of the 1960s. Since then, African-American communities have continued to be under surveillance and continue to be targeted by the police. Black Lives Matter picnic reflects approximately 4,000 Black people who were lynched between 1882 and 1962. They were lynched in settings that are appro appropriately described as picnic-like. Philip Dre, a historian, stated in his 2002 book, The Lynching of Black America, quote, lynching was an undeniable part of daily life, as distinctly as American as baseball games and church suppers. Men brought their wives and children to the events, posed for commemorative photographs, and purchased souvenirs of the occasion as if they had been to a company picnic." End quote. Sometimes the lynch mob acted with haste, in other cases, the lynching was a long, a long drawn out affair with speeches, food eating, and ritualistic and sadistic torture. For example, victims were dragged behind cars, pierced with knives, burned with hot irons or blow torches, had their fingers and toes cut off, had their eyes cut out, and people were also castrated. All before being hanged, or burned to death. One Mississippi paper referred to these gruesome acts as, quote, Negro barbecues, end quote. Black Lives Matter, Keep Your Eye on the Prize, honors the folk song, Keep Your Eye on the Prize, that became an influential song during the American Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s. It is based on the traditional song, Gospel Plow, also known as Hold On and Keep Your Hand on the Plow. An early reference of the older song, Gospel Plow, is in Alan Lomax's 1949 book, Our Singing Country, 
The book references a 1937 recording by ELU trustee of Plattsville, Kentucky, which is in the Library of Congress. The first is from the English folk songs from the Southern Appalachians published in 1917, indicating that that gospel plow dates from at least the early 20th century. The second reference is to the 20, 1928 book, American Negro Folk Songs, which shows an African-American heritage of the original song. This image honors the Black people past and present, particularly Black women, for their perseverance since their arrival of, as slaves in the United States. Black Lives Matter lynching. Throughout the late 19th century, racial tension grew throughout the United States. As slaves gained freedom, lynchings became a popular way of resolving anger whites had in relation to free Blacks. From 1882 to 1968, 4,743 lynchings occurred in the United States. Of these people that were lynched, 3,446 were Black. Blacks accounted for 72.7% of the people lynched. These numbers seem large, but it is known that not all lynchings were recorded. Of the 4,743 people lynched, 1,297 were white people. That is 27.3% of the population that were lynched. Many of the whites lynched were murdered for helping Blacks, for being anti-lynching, and also for domestic crimes. Black Lives Matter still an incident. May 26, 1968 through December 23, 2020. This piece is in honor of unarmed black and brown people killed by police, sheriff deputies, and security guards from May 1968 to December 2020. The report next to the art piece and listed on the art lists each person by their name, birth and death dates, the location of their death, the means of their death, the date of their death, and the name of the police department. Henry Dumas is the first person listed in this project. His poetry serves as the epitaph for this memorial. He was shot by New York City Transit Police on May 23rd, 1968 and his poem called In Memoriam is a reflection of this piece. And his words state, the universe shrank when you went away. Every time I thought your name, stars fell upon me. Names for this were called from, a, a, called from a variety of online sources, including Black Lives Matter protests, Wikipedia, Black Past, Dangerous Objects, a website run by Mercy Carriga that investigates cases of excessive use of force and death by police, as well as professors Cassandra Cheney and Ray Lee Robertson's essay, Armed and Dangerous an examination of fatal shootings of unarmed Black people by police. In addition, women from the hashtag Save Her Project are listed as society often ignores the injustices and violence that Black and Brown women experience from the police. Police brutality is real for women as it is for men. This piece also is significant because the fabric is from t-shirts worn by Black Lives Matter peaceful protesters who took to the Minneapolis streets to fight for justice for the murder of George Floyd. I collected the shirts after the march and then used them into this piece that you will see here. A special thank you also to Renee Atler for her website, reneeatler.com, for managing the names of the innocent lives stolen at the hands of police, security guards, and sheriff deputies. 
Black Lives Matter essential worker is a salute to the essential workers during the COVID-19 spread across the planet in 2020. In the United States, Black, Indigenous, and people of color were dis disproportionately affected. This piece honors the work of essential workers. It was made in collaboration with Black healthcare essential workers, particularly those who clean hospitals. Upcycling mops and sewing them into the canvas, I use acrylic and spray paint over the mops to honor the work of essential workers by celebrating the Black and Brown women who helped spread, who helped stop the spread of coronavirus. Black Lives Matter, Cycle of Violence. Behaviors growing in complexity from the outer to the inner target are a testament to actions. Although the behaviors at each level negatively impact individuals and groups, as one moves closer to the pinnacle of hate, behaviors have more life-threatening consequences. The center is supported by the outer levels. If people or institutions treat behaviors on the lower levels as being acceptable or normalized, the results in behaviors at the next level becoming more acceptable. Bias, if not confronted, can lead to death. In the lives of Black and Brown people, as well as other marginalized communities, this is particularly evident. Black Lives Matter AIDS. Growing up in the 1980s during the height of the AIDS pandemic, I was an active participant with ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power in Washington, DC. I was a volunteer at Whitman Walker Clinic, teaching hot, erotic, safer sex, as well as promoting an IV needle exchange, focusing on communities of color. 40 years later, the Black community accounts for a higher proportion of new HIV diagnoses and people with HIV compared to other races and ethnicities. For example, in 2018, Black people accounted for 13% of the total U.S. population, but 42% of new HIV diagnoses in the United States, the majority of which are men who are engaged in sex with other men. Black Lives Matter, Hear Me. While Black Americans have been experiencing inequities and systems of oppression throughout US history. The current new cycle of murders and harassment has highlighted this racism. One of the darkest legacies of racism in the United States is the near complete removal of Black voices from issues of consequence. In the modern day, white Americans have mistaken visibility for voice. Because black and brown faces were more visible in popular culture, or even in the United States presidency, some white people believe the problems of the past were left in the past. But seeing is not hearing. Only when we stop and listen, when people are heard, do we begin to break down the barriers of inequality and work toward a world where black lives matter. Black lives matter, I am. Black and brown women are the foundation of a strong community. They are the thread that is woven throughout the lives of an ever-changing and dynamic paradigm shift. I am is a reflection of the inner voices women of color carry warrior and caregiver, breadwinner and queen, lover and voice of social justice. Whose lives matter? Black lives matter. 
This piece represents Black women and men incarcerated in the United States. There are 3 million people in US prisons today. Between 1980 and 2015, the number of people incarcerated increased from roughly 500,000 to 2.2 million. The United States represents 5% of the global population and yet nearly holds 25% of the world's prison population. Blacks are incarcerated at five times the rate of Caucasians. Black women are imprisoned at two times the rate of Caucasian women. 7% of the adults in the United States are under correctional supervision. That is 7% of the entire US population. This equates to one out of every 37 adults in the United States. 35% of the individuals executed under the death penalty within the last 40 years have been Black. Black Americans represent 13.4% of the population, though pursued, convicted, and sent to death at a disproportional higher rate than any other race in the United States. Black people make up more than 41% of death row inmates but only 13.4% 13 of the US population. Policing and prison reform is essential if Americans truly value justice, equity, and equality for all people. Black Lives Matter, share Cropper's quilt. Slavery was abolished in the end of the Civil War and with the passage of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution in 1865. With no more free labor and approximately 3.5 million people no longer in bondage, the Southern economy collapsed. From slavery to newly freed, many worked the same land lived in the same housing and worked under close supervision of the same overseers, sharecropping was, quote, slavery under another name, end quote. Sharecroppers' behavior was monitored by white superintendents who were paid from crop yields before settling. And settling is, is talking about cutting into the sharecropper's earnings. Undefined gross misconduct could result in tenants being made to leave and completely forfeit their share of the crops. Furthermore, sharecropping farmers were prohibited from selling crops on their own without notifying the white landowner and having a superintendent present. In addition, no large gatherings of Black people other than on Sunday for worship were allowed on the land. As racial violence grew and Jim Crow laws tightened, restrictions on every aspect of American life, particularly focusing on the African-American. Six million Black Southerners opted to leave the rural South and move to the Northern cities. This was known as the Great Migration. And it took place between 1916 and 1970. The loss of American, African-American labor in the South led to a substantial decline in tenant farming, and over the course of many years, sharecropping gradually and eventually disappeared. Black Lives Matter, hands up, don't shoot. This phrase became a rallying cry for Ferguson residents who took to the streets to protest the fatal shooting of a black 18 year old boy by a white police officer. Witness accounts spread after the shooting that Brown had his hands raised in surrender, mouthing the words, quote, don't shoot, end quote. These were his last words before being shot 
execution style. The gesture of raised hands became a symbol of outrage over mistreatment of unarmed black youth by police. Each of us can affect change. It is our collective responsibility to address the past, work toward a more inclusive and equitable future, and be present. Black lives matter. It is the act of mattering that we must gather and move forward as a nation. Thank you.